Hello and welcome to Sociology 101. Today we're going to talk about straw manning. Yes, the uh, accusation of misrepresentation. It's very prevalent in this particular discussion from both perspectives. Both sides don't feel like the other side is representing them properly. I've written an article on this very issue and I have um, pretty much come to the conclusion that it's impossible to represent accurately um, the opposition to the satisfaction of every opponent. Why? Because not every opponent is cut from the same cloth. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of Calvinists, just like there's a lot of different kinds of non-Calvinists, and therefore you're not always representing their form of Calvinism or their form of traditionalism or their form of Arminianism or whatever ism they may hold to, and therefore people feel like they're not fully being represented properly. Um, and totally get that. I understand that concern. Um, and therefore, we have to really do due diligence as brothers to try to understand each other individually in the correct way and not overly, you know, broad brush people in a particular perspective or holding to a particular view. And while I understand that Calvinism has different heights, <laughs> there are sublapsarian, infralapsarian, superlapsarian, high Calvinist, low Calvinist, mid Calvinist, uh, author pink kind of Calvinist that deny that God loves everybody, uh, John MacArthur kind of Calvinist that says he does love everybody even though it's a different kind of love, and um, it's some that deny the concept of the extent of the atonement being limited. Some say it's it's more of a four point kind of Calvinism that uh, the atonement at all, is not at all limited and uh, believe like we would. You can go back and forth on all the different various views and understandings of how you unpack uh, the, these different perspectives. And so I, I get that. I understand it. And so what I want to do is interact with um, some good brothers from um, Doctrine and Devotion that I have been uh, kind of talking to in more recent times. Um, the, this is uh, Jimmy and Joe. Uh, they are, um, have a good podcast. I love their banter. Um, they, they're funny to me. <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy listening to them talk. And they don't, they don't talk just on sociology. They have broadcast about all different kinds of subjects. And I listen to, to them pretty regularly. And so I've gotten to uh, kind of like these guys, regardless of our differences on sociology. And, um, and I, I hope that the feeling is mutual, at least on some degree, um, even though in this podcast, I, I, I sense that I may have offended Joe a little bit and I wasn't meaning to, but you'll hear what I mean <laughs> when, whenever, wherever we go through this, but let's, let's listen to, uh, Joe and Jimmy and, uh, then we'll respond. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's when he started, uh, engaging with so us. So Dr. Flowers, um, is a traditionalist theologian. Dude, I love his setup for his podcast though. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I've seen it before. All right. So um, I'm just saying I like it. What, eh, you, know, you know, give the man credit where okay. credit's due. Uh, we could do with less, uh, less, less. I mean, it's like it's, it's his face the whole time. How about like uh, about some some uh, some like, I don't know. Do you want our face? Pu puppets. No, like, do like you puppets coming in or something. I feel like he could do. I feel like he could do more than just his face. Well, I feel like if it was us doing that, it would be our face and that'd oh, be yeah. an issue for people. Oh, no, so people, he's yeah. got the people, face because people would stumble. He's got the face that it, people, you know, you could have that online. You and I, it's like. Well, look, here's the thing. So, um, so well, here's the thing. Um, so Jimmy puts up on Twitter this statement. The guys talk about, quote, bad Calvinists, end quote, and with a link to the podcast. And then Soteriology 101, that's uh, Dr. Flowers, he comes on with, question, weren't bad Calvinists ordained by God to be bad? If so, why are you, who are you to talk back to God by questioning how he has molded his vessels? Okay, let's pull that um, screen grab up here just so you guys can see it yourself. As he explained, it's exactly right. He he did a, a show that I I you know I engaged with already on bad Calvinists. Um, why you know there's some certain Calvinists that become hyper, um, become anti-evangelistic, become cage stage, become mean, those kinds of things. And he they're calling um, their Calvinistic friends to be more cordial and loving. All great stuff. Uh, uh, totally agree with these guys on all that. And and I just posed the question: weren't bad Calvinists? those who are acting poorly, those who become anti-evangelistic and all those kinds of things, aren't those people ultimately ordained, controlled by God to become that way? And and I, I want you to, as you listen to this, notice that the way they answer the question is ultimately to say, yes. Okay? So their answer to that question, unequivocally, yes, God did sovereignly, unchangeably determine for those things to come to pass. That's they unequivocally say that that is the case okay there, there there's no there's no good calvinist in the world who would deny that god is ultimately controlling 
man's decisions. That's what Calvinism, that's the root of Calvinism. But they go on to say, but that doesn't mean man's not responsible for it. I never denied that man was responsible for it. I never denied within Calvinism that men would still be punished or culpable for that which God controlled. This is exactly what we pulled up before when we talked about um, J.I. Packer. Um, remember his quote? Look at it. Actually, I found something even better. This is an article by John Piper, um, who is actually confronting J.I. Packer. He's actually disagreeing with J.I. Packer on that article that we went over in a previous, a previous broadcast. And so look what um, Piper writes about Packer. It says, in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, J.I. Packer argues that the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man is an antinomy. He defines antinomy as an appearance of a contradiction between conclusions which seems equally logical, reasonable, or necessary. It is neither dispensable nor comprehensible. It is unavoidable and insoluble. We do not invent it and we cannot explain it. God orders and controls all things, human actions among them. So the question that I ask, did not bad Calvinists, were they not controlled by God? Were they not ordained by God? Were they not, um, what is it not brought a pa to pass by God for his own glorification? The answer to that question, according to John Piper and J.I. Packer, two leading mainstream Calvinists, yes, God orders and controls even the actions of bad Calvinists when they become anti-evangelistic. He controls their actions. And yet, Calvinists, like good Calvinists, like Joey and Jimmy here, Joe and Jimmy here are denouncing bad Calvinists. But they're denouncing the Calvinists who are acting exactly like God controlled them to act. Okay? So he holds every man responsible for the choices he makes and the courses of action he pursues. So I never denied that. I never said that God wouldn't punish a bad Calvinist for acting badly, just like he wouldn't, you know, fail to punish, you know, uh, the non-elect people for rejecting Christ. Obviously, they spend eternity being punished for their rejection of Christ, even though they had nothing to do with that. In other words, they, they couldn't control it. Um, God's controlling it. So they're being punished for something that God controls. That's the basis of Calvinism. That's a baseline view of Calvinism. It's a holding, it's holding determinism. But you're responsible for what God determines. That's, that's the basis of what compatibilistic Calvinism is. If it, that's not true, Joe, if that's not true, Jimmy, I'd love to have you on the program and prove that and, and show it. Because everything that I see, um, everything that, that I have uh, read explicitly from the lowest to the highest forms of Calvinists have explicitly affirmed divine meticulous providential determinism of God of all things he controls as it says here the choices of man but yet he still holds them responsible he controls their choices he controls what they do but he still punishes them justly and that's inexplicable according to Packer now the thing that Piper goes on to explain here is that this is not really an antinomy which is really a redefinition of the word contradiction because Piper is not one who would ever admit to holding to a contradiction or something that's inexplicable. He feels like he needs to explain it. And so he goes through and uses Edwards and other things to to contradict or to, to confront what Jab Packer said was uh, inex, you know, insoluble and, and, and unable to be explained. And he goes on to say, well, no, it can be explained and it's not inexplicable and it's not a uh, an apparent um, contradiction. Um, and, and, and then he goes on to give a defense for a higher view of Calvinism that I think J.I. Packer actually held to. Um, but y'all remember this article that we used from monergism.com, which explains exactly what Joe and Jimmy go on to explain as what compatibilism is. You'll hear them explain this, not in these exact words, but what they're defending is compatibilistic Calvinism. You know, many of you have seen this before. If you've watched the program, it's from monergism.com. Phil Johnson of Grace to You Ministries with John MacArthur, he's the one that tweeted this to me, saying that he affirmed this belief. And it's simply the question, how can God be sovereign and man still be free? Responsibility and voluntary choice are not the same thing as free will. We affirm that man is indeed responsible for the choices he makes. Yet we deny that the Bible teaches that man has a free will since it is nowhere taught in the pages of Scripture. The Bible teaches rather that God ordains all things that come to pass, and it also teaches that man is culpable for his choices. Since the Scripture is, on, is our ultimate authority and the highest presupposition, the multitude of clear scriptural declarations on this matter outweigh all unaided human logic. 
we find that almost always the objections to God's meticulous providence over all things are moral and philosophical rather than exegetical. I would disagree with that, obviously, because the bulk of my show is exegetical commentary on why Calvinism is not true or supported. So this means we must strive to consciously affirm what the Scripture declares over all our finite understanding and sinful inner drive for independence. In order to understand this better, theologians have come up with the term compatibilism to describe the concurrence of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Compatibilism is a form of determinism, and it should be noted that this position is no less deterministic than hard determinism. In other words, this is hard theistic determinism. It simply means that God's predetermination and meticulous providence is compatible with voluntary choice. Our choices are not coerced. We do not choose against what we want or desire, yet we never make choices contrary to God's sovereign decree. What God determines will always come to pass. In light of Scripture, according to compatibilism, man's choices are exercised voluntarily, but the desires and circumstances, notice this, the desires and circumstances that bring about these choices occur through divine determinism. Please read that, okay? So you're acting according to your desire, and for a Calvinist, that's what some, some call free will. Um, some call liberty of the will. Um, some call it um, uh, the voluntary will. In other words, they're acting according to their desires. But who controls the desires? Ladies and gentlemen, who controls the desires? On Calvinism, God does. Period. End of discussion. That's what, that's what the leading compatibilist and Calvinists say. God controls all things, and the desires spring from the nature within the given circumstances that are controlled by God. The desires and circumstances that bring about these choices occur through divine determinism. So he uses, again, the, the ordaining of the crucifixion, which we've gone over a hundred times here. That's proof that God brings about the crucifixion through the use of rebellious men or through the, the redeeming of a bad situation and using rebellious hearts to bring about the crucifixion doesn't prove that God works to bring about all the sins that he was crucified for. That is a self-defeating argument. It's like saying that because the police... Uh, conduct a sting operation, therefore police bring about all crime. It's, it's, it's a non sequitur, it's, it's silly, um, and it's just not true, but that's the way they use it. They'll say, well, look how he brought about the first Passover through Pharaoh. Look, he hardened his heart. Therefore, must mean that God always hardens people's heart when they sin. It must mean that every time a non-elect person doesn't come to Christ, it must be because God you know, chose to harden them and didn't really want them and doesn't really love them. Again, it does not follow. Um, because God chooses to, at times, hide his identity, as in the mess Messianic secret, when Jesus was speaking in parables to them and not revealing to himself who he was and telling his disciples, keep things quiet for a while. It's not time yet to reveal my identity. Because he's hiding his identity, like a police officer in a sting operation would, doesn't mean that God doesn't really love them or doesn't want them to eventually come to know who he is. It means that he's temporarily hiding his identity so as to accomplish strategically his purposes of redemption. And to interpret that wrongly from the context of the first century leads to erroneous ideas that God doesn't really love people or doesn't really want them all to come and all of these kinds of um, nonsensical conclusions that some people can bring to the text. And so going back to this accusation of misrepresentation, notice what the question was. Did God control the bad choices of bad Calvinists? Did God ordain that to come to pass for his own self-glorifying ends? The answer to that question unequivocally, even from Joe and Jimmy, as you listen to this broadcast, has to be yes. It is yes. But he goes on to clarify, but you've got to understand they're still responsible, which what does that mean? Well, look at, look at uh, what John, John uh, Piper says in that same article. He tells you what that means. See, look what he says here. He says, but the moral inability to do a good thing, because we wouldn't want to, because again, our wanter is broken. We don't have the desire to do it. That's a moral inability. Okay, When you don't have a desire to do something, that's what he calls moral inability. And you're born like that. You're born a hater of God and incapable of wanting to do anything but reject and hate God. That's the moral inability of the T of total inability, total depravity. Okay, so, but moral inability to do a good thing does not excuse our failure to do it. Though we love darkness rather than light and therefore can't, because of moral inability, come to the light, nevertheless, we are responsible for not coming. 
In other words, that's what Calvinism teaches. You can't come, but you're punished justly for not coming. That's what they mean by responsible. When I say word responsible, silly me, I actually think it means ability to respond, but that's not the way they're using it. They're using it more like the word culpable or punishable justly, that God is just to punish you even though you can't do anything but reject God because it's this moral inability. And so, nevertheless, you are responsible for not coming. That is, we can be justly punished. That's what I just said. We can be justly punished for not coming, even though it was not within our moral capacity to come. This conforms with an almost universal human judgment for the stronger a man's desire is to do evil, the more unable he is to do good, and yet the more wicked he is judged to be by men. If men really believed that moral inability excused a man from guilt, then man's wickedness would decrease in proportion to the t- intensity of his love of evil. But this is contrary to moral sensibilities of almost all men. Therefore, moral inability and moral necessity on the one hand and human accountability on the other hand are not an antinomy. This is when, again, he's fighting against or he's arguing against J.I. Packer's claim that this is just a, you know, insoluble mystery, um, a, you know, an antinomy, apparent contradiction. Um, Their unity is not contrary to reason or to the common moral experience of mankind. Therefore, in order to see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility perfectly cohere, one need only realize that the way God works in this world is not by imposing natural necessity on men. That's a physical necessity. Like if somebody were to strap you to a chair, you couldn't get out of it. And therefore, you wouldn't be held culpable for not getting out of the chair. But what's the difference if I give you a drug that makes you not want to stand up? Because that's ultimately the difference between what he's described as moral inability and the, the, the physical um, inability. Because whether I strap you to a chair or I put a spell on you to make you desire to not ever stand up again, either way, I am the one who is determining that you're going to stay seated in that chair, whether by physical force or through manipulation of your nature, i.e. circumstances, i.e. desires, all of which God equally controls within the Calvinistic worldview. This is what so many um, uh, philosopher, philosophical scholars, which, by the way, most theistic Christian philosophers are on our side of this debate. If you haven't studied and looked at the philosophical discussions in this area and you've only listened to the J.I. Packers and the, the Sprouls and the MacArthur's, you're listening to the theologians. Try listening to some of the philosophers, the, the leading theological philosophers, the leading, I should say, Christian philosophers hold to the view that I propose, okay? Just just so you know. Um, so God works in the world is not by imposing natural necessity on men and then holding them accountable for what they can't do, even though they're, they will to do it, but rather God so disposes all things, all things, including bad Calvinists, okay? So again, the answer to the question that I asked that he kind of laughed off and mocks is yes, God did sovereignly control, ordain, bring to pass the bad actions of bad Calvinists. But those bad actions of bad Calvinists, they're still responsible for that. We're all acknowledging that is true within Calvinism. Now the question, why are you questioning God? God's the one who disposed it. God's the one who brought it to pass. God's the one who controlled it. And yes, he's still going to hold them responsible for it. But why are you bemoaning it? Why are you questioning God's plan and what he brought to pass? That's the question. And I'm sorry, but Doctrine and Devotion guys, Jimmy, Joe, you didn't answer that question. You never told me why it's okay for you to question God and his ordained controlled plan. If his plan is to bring about bad Calvinists and then to punish bad Calvinists and hold them responsible for being bad anyway, it still didn't answer the question as to why you have the right to question him for doing that, does it? Okay, that's all I'm saying. I mean, obviously, if your worldview is true, he's also bringing about your desire to question bad Calvinists. So I guess he's causing you to do things that are irrational because it seems irrational to question the God that you worship and love for his choice to bring about bad Calvinism and to punish bad Calvinists justly because they have a apparently a moral inability to do otherwise because God ultimately controls the circumstances and the desires by which they bring about their decisions and therefore you're questioning God. Again, I don't see the fault in my logic. If you can point it out to me, I would be glad to listen to it if you want to have a reasonable discussion about that. But 
so far and from what I've heard, that doesn't seem to be the desire here. But let's see. Now, honestly, I thought it was a joke. I legitimately thought he was joking with us because oh, yeah, he's been yeah. friendly. Yeah, he's been, yeah, I thought and, it was a joke. And too. we joke around, right? We'll, we've been respectful. Mm-hmm. I feel like we've been very respectful. Um, that's going to end today, everybody. No, no, it's I'm not. I'm taking off the gloves. Nope, it's not going to okay. end today. Um, but we've been very respectful and playful. And so I thought, oh, he must be joking. And so I was like, ha ha, oh man, please tell me you're, and I, yes, I spelled you are wrong. It's just, yes. Yeah, so, tell me you're joking around, Leighton. And then he said, before replying, please read this article to better understand our position and our question. I'm asking with respect. And I said, oh, I will find time to read the article. But your statement shows a lack of understanding for the reform position. Now, that's not the only thing he tweeted. Uh, Okay. Does my question show a lack of understanding for the reform position? Didn't we just read from Piper and Packer? And... Uh, you're about to hear them actually read from other Calvinists who say virtually the exact same thing, that God has brought to pass. He controls all things. He sovereignly determines all things. That's not a question. The answer to that first part of the question, were bad Christians ordained by God to be bad? The answer is yes. So the second part of the question is, who are you to bemoan or to question what God has ordained and planned? Instead, what you'll hear them do is to refocus it and say, well, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Those bad Calvinists are still responsible for their bad actions because they're doing what they want to do. Well, who said they weren't? I, everybody knows compatibilism. I understand that. I understand God's going to punish them, and it's and you believe that's just for him to punish that which he controls. I understand that. doesn't answer the question as to why you're talking back to God, though, does it? Again, how else are you to take that except for the way he just described it? Now, on the, on the disrespect thing, I know this sounds disrespectful, um, to him, and I, and I apologize, I wasn't meaning to be sound or disrespectful. This is this is a common thing that you'll see from a Calvinist. As you can see, this is a legitimate argument. This is a philosophical, I'm reading the philosophical journals where this is um, talked about on a much higher level than what we're talking about here on the podcast, but I've, I've read the actual scholars, the PhDs in the field discussing this very issue, and so I know it's a legitimate question. I know it is. And so, Whenever people laugh off a legitimate question in the way kind of Joe does there, and maybe that that didn't mean to sound disrespectful, but when you say, ha-ha, man, you got to be joking, that sounds kind of disrespectful to me, especially when I'm asking a genuine question. Um, and so the, the second part here is, well, you'll, I'll pull it up here, and then you can also hear him talk about it. Um, because he didn't uh, tag me in this. Um well, did he tag Doc and Devo or no? You're saying no. Well, it says because uh, some other people jumped in on there. All right, so here's here's all I see. I see, um, and, and yeah, they are tagged. I mean, it's a quote tag, so I'm not trying to hide it from them. I'll put up a screen grab. Uh, he says he's he's referring to ha ha. Oh man, please tell me you are joking around. And his response to that for his listeners at large is, when one has a good answer, he gives it. When he doesn't. Dot, 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 this. And then he pointed to And he to pointed him. down to it. I don't feel like that's very respectful, dude. I, actually, I honestly feel like that was a little weak. Um, I, I have plenty of answers. I don't deem this sort of a thing worthy of much time. Um, and I well, th- actually thought... Media, yeah. Uh, yeah, on social media. So I, like, all right, so whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to address the straw man that you have created. Now, uh, the thing that... Um, that la- Again... A straw man is when you have misrepresented somebody else's perspective. I ask a question. Didn't misrepresent it. I ask a question. The question is, did not God ordain X? Bad Calvinist. The answer to that question for a Calvinist, unequivocally, yes. And they even go on to affirm God does ordain. He decrees all things that come to pass. So is that a misrepresentation? So the second part is a question, too. Why are you talking back to God's plan to bring about bad Calvinists? Is that misrepresenting Calvinism? How so? It's a question. You just didn't ever answer the question. So how am I misrepresenting Calvinism? What Eaton does is, is he'll say frequently, hey, this is not a straw man argument. I'm just quoting from the sources. Well, and, and even that article that he posted, he, he yeah, tries I'll, to I'll link pre- to that. Yeah, make sure we, yeah, he preempts that argument. Right. So he's like, hey, this is not a straw man. But look, Leighton, just because you say your straw man isn't a straw man 
uh, that doesn't uh, make it an animated sentient being that's skipping down the yellow brick road out of Oz, okay? Uh, it's still a scarecrow. It's still a straw man if it doesn't accurately represent the views of Calvin and, um, uh, and the reformers. So uh, in this article, uh, Leighton uh, pulls quotes about God's absolute sovereignty yeah. from – uh, from actually from John Calvin and John Piper, he went with two Johns, uh, like maybe the oldest John and the newest John in, in Calvinism, and um, and you know Piper's whatever. Uh, he's certainly a Calvinist, a representative of Calvinism, but Calvin, that's definitely a good one for him to pick. Mm-hmm. So what we're what we're dealing with here, and, and I want you to notice he doesn't read the quotes that I put in that article because they will absolutely show that I'm not misrepresenting Calvinism. I mean, they're una- I mean, unequivocal. You'll, you can see them in the show notes for yourself. Um, it, it's undeniable what John Piper holds to when he says, I don't believe God just uh, works out the evil, that he actually brings about child rape. He actually brings about the Holocaust for his glory. That's a direct quotes, as you've heard plenty of times on this podcast, because we disagree with it so vehemently and think it, it besmirches the character of God. Um the Calvin quotes that we've read a thousand, he didn't go, he didn't actually read any of those. What he does is goes to softer Calvinists like a, a Spurgeon, an inconsistent Calvinist who uh, has almost as many quotes opposing Calvinistic kinds of doctrines that we are learning from Piper as he does for them. As we've read a dozen times here as well. He, he The Second Peter 3, 9 passage and things like that, First Timothy 2, 4, he rails on high Calvinists for trying to remove the alls of, of Scripture um, and those kinds of things, Spurgeon does. And he's kind of one of those inconsistent kind of uh, lower forms of Calvinism, um, which is fine. I mean, I'm not trying to deny that he holds to some Calvinistic views, but back in those days, sometimes Calvinism was really about whether you could lose your salvation or not. The whole thing about Arminianism and Calvinism was, well, once saved, always saved, and that kind of that debate. And so sometimes people kind of took sides into those two camps without really considering all the other nuances of other different points. Um, again, I'm not trying to deny that Spurgeon um, held to uh, a form of Calvinism, a modified form of Calvinism, but he was by far a consistent defender of Calvinism. Like I said, there's almost as many quotes uh, against Calvinism as for them from from Spurgeon. Is, you know, his his actual tweet, which is, weren't bad Calvinists ordained by God to be bad? And if so, who are you to talk bad to God by questioning how he's molded his vessels? In other words, if God determined in advance that you would be a bad Calvinist— then um, you cannot um, ask God why he finds fault with you. This is just the way that you are. And he links us back to an article which essentially says that we are— Now notice what he kind of did there. He kind of switched the goalposts, changed the goalpost over. It wasn't—I did not ask him whether or not it was just of God— to condemn the bad Calvinist or to judge the bad Calvinist. I didn't ask if God couldn't do that. I already know that within compatibilism, there's an idea that God controls their choice and God still justly judges them for that choice because it's their desire to do it. And therefore they're held justly accountable because it's their desire, even though God's the one who ultimately brings about their desires and their circumstances so as to meticulously determine all things that come to pass. Um, and, And he would be just to condemn I didn't, it doesn't have any, none of that has anything to do with the question. My question is, who's Joe to question what God's doing in that process? God's the one who's bringing about bad Calvinist. God's the one who's punishing the bad Calvinist for being bad. Who is Joe to question that process because God's the one who's doing it? That's my question, which again, you've got to ask yourself, does Joe ever even address that question in this entire broadcast? Um, as Calvinists, that we don't believe, that we believe that God is essentially the originator of sin, that, yeah, he, yeah. He, that, that we are not responsible for the actions uh, that we make in this life that are, are sinful. Okay, did I say any of that in that, in that tweet? Does, does my article say that? Or does my article represent what we've just already said, that mankind is held responsible in the Calvinistic worldview, meaning punishable, justly punishable, even though he can't respond Even though he can't do otherwise, morally speaking, he's held punishable. That's what Calvinism teaches. That's what we've said in a dozen broadcasts long before I've met, talked to Joe and Jimmy. So you know full well this is what we've been representing as compatibilistic Calvinism for a long time. Um, And so 
again, this is why I, I kind of tweeted back to him. I said, it is possible to straw man somebody's argument against you with a straw man. In other words, he's misrepresenting my argument against him, which is ironically actually the straw man here. And so I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to make a, make a distinction here. All right, go ahead. Okay. So the distinction is this in, in his article, um, called disapproving God's plan. Yeah. Um, he is saying that Calvinists shouldn't be able to be horrified by the evil actions of men because God has ordained them. And since God has ordained them for us to be aghast at what has happened, we're essentially aghast at God's plan. So the distinction I want to make is between the evil actions and intentions of men yeah. and the sovereignty of God. In other words, we have to make a distinction right, between the, the sovereign decree of God and the responsibility of man. So in this article, what Leighton does is, is he quotes from Calvin – a whole bunch, and I, it's great. He apparently knows how to use Lagos and to search for quotes um, because he has all of these quotes on Calvin speaking about uh, God's divine decree, his absolute sovereignty over good and evil, even sins and all of that. This is not a surprise. The Reformed tradition believes in this. Yeah. Um, we, in, our, in our confessions, in our catechism, we say things like, um, the decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his own will, whereby for his own glory he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Okay. Um, in, in my article called The Accusation of Misrepresentation, I go through six different reasons there's accusation of misrepresentation. One of those is the palatability of the statement. In other words, you can say something that sounds really palatable, easy to swallow. What he just said there is just that. It's real palatable. You know, God and his ordaining counsel of his will can bring about all things for the glorification of his goodness and the exaltation of his, you know, kind and good intentions, that kind of a thing. Real palatable, flows off the lips, just, oh, wow, that's good doctrine, okay? Sounds great, okay? So God ordains whatsoever comes to pass means, and I know this is harsh and this is kind of the hard part of it, but this is the theology when it's become rubber meets the road. God brings about the rape of children for his own glory. Okay, now that's not palatable anymore. Is it a misrepresentation? Well, is child rape a part of all things? Because you just said all things. Um, God brings it about. Not that he just permitted it. Matter of fact, Piper's very clear, and so is Calvin, very clear, to say this is not bare permission. This is not God just working things out for his good. This is God bringing about the actual evil for his good. Those were the actual quotes I read from Calvin and from Piper because they take a higher view of Calvinism and they defend that God is bringing about the evil desires, intentions, and actions of men for his greatest glorification. That is what I've been contending with. That's what I continue to contend with. And either these guys don't see that or they do see it and they agree with it, but for unknown reasons that they haven't explained yet. All right. So we believe that. Like yeah. that's something that we believe. God is or has um, orchestrated all things for his own glory and everything happens according to plan. OK. So just to be clear of what they're affirming, they say we believe that we affirm that. OK, here's the article that they're saying they affirm. So Joe and Jimmy are saying they affirm this. They've already affirmed that God does bring about God does ordain bad Calvinists because that was the question which they seem to paint as a straw man, but right now they're actually affirming that God does ordain bad Calvinist. Um, again, here's Piper Ministry website from Desiring God. This is what they said they affirm. God brings about all things in accordance with his will. In other words, it isn't just that God manages to turn the evil aspects of our world to good for those who love him. It is rather that he himself brings about these evil aspects for his glory and his people's good. This includes, as incredible and unacceptable as it may currently seem, God's having even brought about the Nazis' brutality at Birchowal and Auschwitz, as well as the terrible killings of Dennis Rader and even the sexual abuse of a young child. And you can see the link there. You can go check it out in its context. Fully welcome all of those things, okay? Um, Calvin, creatures are so governed by the secret counsel of God that nothing happens but what he is knowingly and willingly decreed. Thieves, murderers, evil doers, or instruments of divine providence being employed by the Lord himself to execute judgments, which he has resolved uh, to inflict. In other words, did not, he even goes on here, to deny permission. It's not about God permitting these things to happen. 
God is the disposer, the ruler of all things, the, the instigator it even uses in this terminology. From the remotest eternity, according to his own wisdom, he decreed what he was to do, and now by his power executes what he's decreed. Whence um, maintain that by his providence, not heaven and earth and inanimate creatures only, but also the counsels and wills of men. So there's been some of them say, God doesn't, God doesn't determine the will of man. God doesn't determine the desires of men. Um, again, it, it, okay, if men are doing what their greatest desire is and God is determining their will, their desire, then who is determining their action? God is. The same God that James says doesn't even tempt men to evil the Calvinist says God controls their desires to make them where they can only do that which is evil. Is that biblical? Again, I would love to have that discussion with these guys if they want to have that discussion, but this is not misrepresenting Calvinism. This is Calvinism 101. This is exactly what Calvin taught. And this is exactly what they're saying they, they are affirming. Um, Many professing a desire to defend the deity from an individual charge, this is Calvin, admit the doctrine of election, but deny in any one sense reprobation. This they do ignorantly and childishly, since there could be no election without the opposite reprobation. So all those Calvinists out there, like J.D. Greer, who we um, recently went over, um, who try to deny the concept of reprobation, of double predestination, there's what Calvin says about that. I wouldn't call yourself a Calvinist if you deny the concept of reprobation, because Calvin clearly didn't. It's utterly inconsistent to transfer preparation for destruction to anything but God's secret plan. God's secret plan is the cause of hardening. Um, again, all from Calvin, I admit that in this mystery, condi miserable condition wherein men are now bound, all of Adam's children have fallen by God's will. In other words, the fall happened by God's will. Not It wasn't permitted by God. Not He didn't allow it to happen. It happened by God's will. Uh, with Augustine, I say, the Lord, again, Piper talking, the Lord, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Calvin talking. It's a different John, okay? John Calvin's talking. The Lord has created those whom he unquestionably foreknew would go to destruction. This has happened because he has willed it, okay? So if within the Calvinistic worldview, God doesn't just foreknow what will happen. God wills that it happen, okay? So God is the one who ultimately brings these things to pass. Individuals are born who are doomed from the womb to certain death, and are to glorify him by their destruction. In other words, some are created for destruction, for the glory of God's God in their destruction. It is vain to debate about prescience, foreknowledge, when it is clear that all events take place by his sovereign appointment. Again, that's Cal, uh, Calvin. Um, but since he foresees future events only by reason of the fact that he decreed that they should take place. In other words, the only reason he knows it's coming is because he is determined for it to come which actually doesn't align very well with 1 Samuel 23 when God foreknew that Saul was going to come to the city. And so he told David and David left and then therefore Saul um, didn't end up coming to the city. So God foresaw that Saul would come to the city, but Saul didn't end up coming to the city, proving that foreknowledge or foresight of something does not equal foredetermination of it. And it doesn't necessitate foredetermination of it. Okay. God can foreknow possible contingencies without being the foreordainer or the a determiner of those those things that happen in the future. Those were free choices. David's choice to leave the city, Saul's choice not to go once he heard that David left the city were all contingencies. And God may know all possible contingencies, but it doesn't mean he's determined those free moral choices um, of those agents. It gets into the philosophical. Okay, going back to uh, Joe and Jim here. And so that's fine. If you're just going to pick out those statements and leave it there, then you might be able to draw the wrong conclusion that we believe that people are just robots and they're not responsible for what they do. Where, where did I say people are just robots and not responsible for what they do? No. According to Calvinism, people are acting according to the greatest preset desire, which is ultimately determined by the circumstances and the nature, all of which is controlled by God under his meticulous providence. It's not, that's not robotic. That's deterministic, but it's not robotic necessarily. Now, you could use the analogy of a robot, just like sometimes people apply the analogy of the clay, I think, wrongly within the scriptures. And the application of the Calvinist with the clay and the potter, the clay has no more control over his shape with the potter under the Calvinistic interpretation of the clay and the potter than a puppet or a robot has over the puppet master or the robot maker, do, does he? So you can't get too mad at us using the analogies about robots and puppets if 
indeed your interpretation has clay pots without any responsibility, uh, regardless of the fact that in other passages like Jeremiah 18 and um, 2 Timothy 2, um, where he clearly says that the clay vessels have responsibility. If you cleanse yourself, you will be used by the maker um, in a, in a, in a, uh, for a noble cause. Um, and that the clay pots in the Jeremiah 18 clearly had to repent in order for the Lord to relent in the evil that he had planned towards them, according to Jeremiah. So when you assume that the pots and the analogies don't have actual responsibility, then that you shouldn't be upset for us to use other analogies like robots and, and puppets as an expression of what you're saying, because that's the way you're applying it in some ways. Oh, and that we can't be horrified at the things that they do. Yeah. Um, but that's not all that we believe. Calvinists believe, yes, that God is sovereign over good and evil, and we believe that man is responsible for what he does. In fact, in the Reformed tradition, we talk about man being a free agent. Um, so let me just um, let me just read a, a couple of things here. I th I th Again, free meaning you act according to your greatest desires, which are determined by God. That's what they mean by free. That's what compatibilism mean by free. So is that free? Okay, is a, is a lion, because it's a carnivorous lion who always chooses to eat meat, because that's an instinctive reflex of a, of a, of a carnivorous lion, is that lion morally responsible for eating meat? Or do we recognize the difference between animal instinct and human choice? And under, under our understanding, we can choose to act in accordance with one of our competing desires. That's our responsibility. It's our choice to decide if I'm going to act on this desire, this desire, this desire, this desire. The desires don't make determinations. I do. Desires influence me as the agent, the free moral agent. I choose to act on which desire I want to act to fulfill. Within the, the, the sprule kind of Calvinism that he describes and, and chosen by God, you've got the desires controlling the agent. The desire determines what the agent will choose versus the agent choosing which desire he'll act upon. Again, what they've reduced um, moral choice to is animal instinctive reaction. There's an animal reflex, uh, instinctive reflex that, that, that the, the person really has no uh, moral control over whatsoever. And that's just not biblical at all in my estimation. I think that this will be helpful. Um, so we'll start with some Spurgeon. I got to so, put yeah, on my glasses. Sorry, which book do you have there? All right. So this is out of uh, Spurgeon versus hyper-Calvinism. And, uh oh, I got a lot of bookmarks in here. Oh, here we go. All right. Here's a quote from Spurgeon, yes, on divine sovereignty and on human responsibility. You've got to see both of them. Yeah, they've got to be hand in hand. I believe in predestination, yea, even in its very jots and tittles. I believe that the path of a single grain of dust in the March wind is ordained and settled by a decree which cannot be violated, that every word and thought of man, every flittering of a sparrow's wing, every flight of a fly, that everything, in fact, is foreknown and foreordained. But I do equally believe in the free agency of man. Okay, just so you know, I, I could probably affirm that maybe not the intention that's behind that author. I, I'm not sure what his intentions were. But if you affirm the concept of permissive decree, in other words, that God has permitted the free moral uh, agency of man and the free moral actions of man, the libertarian free choices of man that God foreknows, and he allows for those free actions to exist, to happen— then there's a sense in which you permissively ordain or you permissively allow for. But that's that's pure Arminianism, okay? That's just God foresees. That's Look down the quarters of time of Arminianism. You foresee what's going to happen, and you allow for those, those things to happen as they do. That's a distinction from, a clear distinction. If you go back and listen to our episode on theodicy, we go through how there's a clear distinction between the permissive will of God, God allowing for free moral uh, choices, libertarian choices, mind you, not compatibilistic. God determines your greatest desire, and therefore you make those choices according to his meticulous providence. But instead, God foreordained, or foreknows true free choices. Um, and this is where you've got to be really careful not to conflate the concept of necessity with certainty. God can certainly know something without being the determiner of that something. And that's the, that's the modal fallacy of because something is certainly known within the infinite mind of God, therefore it must be a necessity, i.e. determined. And that's not necessarily the case. Something can be fixed or certain, but not determined by the one who knows it for certain. And when you conflate those two things, you're just creating, a, 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 again, a philosophical modal fallacy. That man acts as he wills, especially in moral operations, choosing the evil with a will that is unbiased by anything that comes from God, biased only by his own depravity of heart and the perverseness of his habits. Okay. 
biased only by the depravity of his own heart. Who, who, if not God, decides the nature of man from birth? Okay, Who, if not God, is sovereign over and control over the condition of the fallen man's heart? In other words, who, if not God, decided that the punishment for Adam's sin would be that mankind would become morally incapable to do anything but hate God from birth unless he did some irresistible effectual work upon him? Again, I don't know how Calvinists think they're getting away from the reprobation and the double predestination or even the equal ultimacy when it comes to their interpretations of things like Romans 9, when you've got Esau apparently being rejected before he did anything good or bad and thus reprobated um, at the same time that Jacob was supposedly loved um, in a salvific way and the way they interpret it. Obviously, if you read our uh, translations or what we're, uh, how we understand and how many other scholars throughout human history have understood Romans 9. You don't have to come to that individualized, uh, effectual salvation, unconditional election conclusion. But nevertheless, that that's the most common rendering of Romans 9 and how you don't have Esau being ultimately chosen by God to be born in this reprobated condition. In other words, Esau has no more control over his being a hater of God than Jacob does in his being a lover of God. So how's that not equal ultimacy? How's that not equal in his ultimate control over the condition of those two twins once they're born? If, if you are interpreting it from the Calvinistic way of understanding. Choosing the right, too, with perfect freedom, though sacredly guided and led by the Holy Spirit. I believe that man is as accountable as if there were no destiny whatsoever. Okay, and I would agree that it is the Holy Spirit that leads us. How does he do that? Through the gospel. The gospel brings inspiration. So it's not just about the nature of man. It's also about the nature of God's word. I just don't believe that God's word is effectually applied or irresistible. Um, I believe God's word, his, his, his Holy Spirit brings the truth in the light of revelation so as to enable um, or grant the ability of men to respond. So God makes an appeal, and then we're responsible for what we do with that appeal. So God makes a call. He calls all people to himself. He makes an appeal. The Second Corinthians 5.20 says that Christ in us, making his appeal, be reconciled to God, that the gospel was sent for this purpose, that you may believe and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the gospel. So is it sufficient to accomplish that purpose? I believe that it is. Its, its purpose is not to effectually save a pre-select few. Its purpose is to make an appeal to all people. And it's sent to all people, and therefore I think it's sufficient for its biblically stated purpose, which is to make an appeal and that and to permit or to allow for those who hear it to respond. How will they believe in one whom they've not heard? That seems to imply that if they do hear, they may believe. Faith cometh by hearing. So the Holy Spirit brings the gospel, brings the light of revelation, brings the truth so that the hearer may believe it. Now, you may say, well, there's a lot of passages that say, he who has ears, let him hear. And there's a lot of people who, who hear it, but don't perceive it. And they're ever seeing, but not perceiving. Who, who are those verses about? Go read who those verses are about. They're about the hardened Israelites of the day. Just as Paul lays out in, in, in uh, Acts 28, verse 27 and following, these people's heart has become callous, speaking of Israel. They hardly hear with their eyes or see with their ears. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles. They, they, they are unable to see, hear, turn, and understand, and I would heal them. Therefore, I take the message to the Gentiles. He's contrasting Jews with Gentiles. Both of them sinful. Both of them guilty. Both of them have fallen short of God's glory. But the Israelites have become ever seeing but not perceiving. They, they hear, but they're not really hearing. Why? Because their hearts have grown calloused. They're not born already calloused. Okay? They have grown calloused. This is what Romans 9 is about. God giving them over to their callous condition, cutting them off in their unbelief, as Romans 11:20 20 says. And in that, even though he loves them, he's held out his hands to them, he has cut them off, he is grafting in the Gentiles, he brings about his redemptive plan through their rebellion, though they cry out, crucify him. Even through his hardening of Israel, he brings about his promise, his plan. His plan has not failed, his promise has not failed, because even in their rebellion, he brings about his good purposes. That's the context of the New Testament. Where these two truths meet, I do not know, nor do I want to know. They do not puzzle me, since I have given up my mind to believing them both. Mm. So, All right, does that sound familiar? Remember that quote from John Calvin, how it was ordained by the foreknowledge and decree of God, what man's future was? 
without God being implicated as an associate in the fault of the author or the prover of transgression is clearly a secret so much excelling the inside of the human mind that I'm not ashamed to confess ignorance. I daily so mediate on these mysteries of his judgment that curiosity to know anything more does not attract me. In other words, we don't know how God's good. Okay, That's ultimately what he's trying to say. How, how God's character is not implicated as, a, as a, the all-deterministic God that he must be. Wh again, why do you have to assume that God's all-deterministic? The Bible doesn't teach that God determines everything that comes to pass. God doesn't even tempt men to do sin. Why do you insist that he deterministically brings about all evil desires and actions? There's no reason to assume those things. I would much rather appeal to the mystery of man's capriciousness than to appeal to a mystery of God's character. There's one presupposition we can bring to the text. God is good. He's good. He's righteous. He's holy. You know what holiness is? Separateness from humanity. This whole concept of human autonomy, human free will, is a defense of divine holiness. What we're saying is man and man alone is responsible for his desires and his choice to act upon that given desire. God does not determine which choices men will make. Men make those choices. God in his sovereign will does not decree which choice we'll make, but that we'll be free to make it, and that a God less than sovereign would be afraid to give man that kind of freedom, as A.W. Tozer, I think, so eloquently argues. John MacArthur, he's asked a question on YouTube. It says, if God literally brings about everything, then how can he blame us for sinning? And his answer was, quote, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know anyone who does know the answer to that. Sometimes the best answer to that, those kind of questions is, I don't know, according to Burke Parsons and other Calvinists with Linganore Ministries. In other words, the appeal of to mystery, this, this atenomy that J.I. Packer talks about, is how is God not culpable for controlling men's choices and actions? How about we just don't say that God controls men's choices and actions? Because the Bible never teaches that God controls men's choices or actions. God can turn and redeem men's choices for his good pleasure, like a sting operation. He can bring about a good from bad, absolutely. But why in the world do we need to impugn God's character by suggesting that he, quote unquote, determines or brings to pass things like child rape? It's not necessary, and it's not biblical by any stretch of the imagination. Spur Spurgeon says a couple of things here. He says, one, I believe that God has ordained every single thing that happens in the universe. Yes. Every single thing. There is nothing left to chance. There is nothing left to our freedom in a way that is somehow outside of God's decree, his plan. But at the same time, he believes that we are free agents who do what we want to do, and we are not coerced whatsoever. Now, that's Spurgeon. I know some people are like, well, Spurgeon wasn't a real Calvinist or a strict Calvinist. Yeah, he was. Um, and the more you read of him, the more you know that. But uh, just so that we get to the straight dope, um, let's look at the Reformed Doctrine of Predestination by Lorraine Bettner. Uh, listen to this. How can a person be a free and responsible agent if his actions have been foreordained from eternity? By a free and responsible agent, we mean an intelligent person who acts with rational self-determination. And by foreordination, we mean that from eternity, God has made certain the actual course of events which take place in the life of every person and in the realm of nature. It is, of course, admitted by all that a person's acts must be without compulsion and in accordance with his own desires and inclinations. Okay, so without compulsion for the Calvinist means in accordance with what your desire is. Yet, as we already read from monogism.com and from other sources and other broadcasts, that desire is determined by one's nature within the given circumstances, both of which are meticulously brought to pass and determined by God's providence to be, to be such that they could not have chosen otherwise. So God is ultimately the one who is deciding what you will decide. Okay, He's the chooser of all choices. <laughs> he's the determiner of all determinations within that system. And that's ultimately what he's arguing. But we're still culpable because we're doing what we want to do. It doesn't matter that we can't want what we want. We, we're doing what we want because God has decided what we'll want. Um, they'll just kind of ignore that part of it. It's kind of like the, the old analogy we've talked about. If I put a drug in your coffee to make you desire what I want you to desire, no one would consider that free. But for some reason, if God, quote unquote, gives you a new heart or regenerates you and makes your nature change to make you want what he wants you to want, that somehow is considered free according to the Calvinistic worldview. Again, there's no basis on which to call that real freedom in any sense of the word. You're not doing what you desire. I, I think the quote from uh, Clement of, of um, Rome, um, who's re referenced in Philippians, by the way, um, we've got some of his works. I, I think he really handles that issue when he says this. Look, all right, like, like I said, this is from Clement of Rome. 
um, who's referenced in Philippians 4.3. In other words, this is a guy that was a part of the church in Rome and actually referenced in Scripture. I'm not saying that his, his works were obviously canonized or that he, he uh, taught uh, from the canonization, but the fact that he was with Peter in Rome and with um, the, the church in, first century church in Rome and that he says this, that, that kind of carries some weight. He says, he who is good, this is from his, his, his letter, he who is good by his own choice is really good, but he was made good by another's another under necessity is not really good because it's not what he is by his own choice. Catch that? In other words, if it's not really from you, if you're not making a choice because of your own decision, but somebody else has decided for you to decide that, then that's not goodness. That's not your choice. You're, you're doing something because somebody else did it for you. Um, for no other reason does God punish the sinner, either in the present or the future world, except because he knows that the sinner was able to conquer but neglected to gain the victory. In other words, in order to truly hold somebody accountable, they need to be able to account. In order to hold them responsible, they need to be able to respond. That's just the natural understanding of what true accountability um, uh, should be interpreted as and understood as. Desires and inclinations, or he cannot be held accountable for them. If the acts of a free agent are in their very nature, nature contingent and uncertain, then it is plain that foreordination and free agency are inconsistent. So what he's saying here is that um, he's raising this question. Lorraine is raising this objection. How can a person be free if um, and, and responsible if there is a, a decree that includes all things? Yeah. And so he says later on, the same God who, who has ordained all events has ordained human liberty in the midst of these events. And this liberty is as surely fixed as is anything else. Man is no mere automaton or machine. In the divine plan, which is infinite in variety and complexity, which reaches from everlasting to everlasting, and which includes millions of free agents who act and interact and react upon each other, God has ordained that human beings shall keep their liberty under his sovereignty. He has made no attempt to give us a formal explanation of these things, and our limited human knowledge is not able to fully solve the problem. So what... what? So he's taken more J.I. Packer's approach than Piper's approach. Okay, that's again higher versus lower forms of Calvinism. Most of what he just said, I would affirm, uh, even though he's a Calvinist. Um, mostly an appeal to mystery. In other words, there's these two two rails that meet in eternity kind of thing, the two parallel lines that meet in eternity kinds of comments. That's probably the older kind of Calvinist. The Rain Botner would be included in that realm of with the J.I. Packer kind of Calvinist that just kind of held to the antinomy that Packer that Piper is actually con, you know contends with. Uh, later on, because again, Calvinism tends to become more consistent with itself, less consistent with the Bible in my estimation, but more consistent with its the claims of itself. And I think that's what you see here, even from Botner's comments, most of which I, I could affirm. But that's not that's not what Calvin taught. It's not what Piper's teaching even now. Bettner is saying is the same thing that Spurgeon is saying. I believe, and I agree that Bettner and, and Spurgeon probably did hold to a, a less consistent form of Calvinism that are not affirmed by the higher Calvinists of our day. Um, so instead of accusing me of not understanding Calvinism, guys, maybe it's that you disagree with some Calvinists. Just saying. That we are uh, free to do what we want to do, and we will only choose those things that we want to do, and we are not coerced. That's the issue. We are not coerced to do Yeah, but who controls the desire? You just now said you'll you'll choose what you want to do, okay? But who controls your wanter? Just like J.D. Greer in that um, last episode we did, he, your wanter is broken. Sproul says the same thing. Your wanter is broken. Well, who decreed for your wanter to be broken? Who ordained for your wanter to be broken? Who decided that the punishment for the, the sin of Adam would be your wanter would be broken and you would be incapable, morally speaking, of coming when called to be reconciled from that very fall? That you can't be reconciled from the very fall because you're fallen. And God decreed and desired, apparently, for that to come to pass because all things that he ultimately desires come to pass. And therefore, he wanted for your wanter to be broken. And that's the reason you don't desire it. Again, I don't know how you escape that. Something. And yet, every choice that we have made from the Calvinist position is foreordained by God. So in short, Calvinists believe— And again, if it's just the Arminian kind of foreordination— the, the traditionalist kind of forward nation that God for knows all things and his eternal knowledge and that he permits that which is free as Tozer argues fine if you're using forward nation in the permissive sense but 
Calvin denied permission, uh, permissive decrees. He, he thought that was childish and, and vain. Um, that's true Calvinism, because what is there to permit in a world where all things are determined by God? What is there to permit except for his own decrees? Unless you have an autonomous will of the creature, there's nothing to permit and or restrain unless you affirm the autonomous free will of creatures. That human beings are responsible for their actions and that God is still sovereign over them. So to say like, well, uh, you, you, you can't. Which is what we just read from um, Packer earlier. Remember that from Piper's article, God's in control, but God still punishes, okay? So God punishes you for the sins that he controlled you doing. That's what they're saying. If that's not accurate, then tell me it's not accurate. But if Calvinists just came right out and just said that, it'd be a lot less, I think, a rise of Calvinism because people would actually understand what they're saying, okay? God controls the fact and the decisions and desires that you will sin. He controls that. And yet, he holds you responsible for what he himself determines that you have no control. You don't have control of whether you're regenerate or not. You don't have control of your desire to hate and reject him. He controls whether you desire or reject him. He, does, he controls that, yet he's going to hold you justly accountable for that. That's what they're saying. That's what you believe. Is that what you believe the Bible teaches? You got to decide that for yourself. Can't uh, Calvinists, you know, they 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 really can't be uh, aghast at what people do because they simply believe that God has foreordained that they do those evil deeds. I never said that they couldn't be aghast for it. Obviously, you are aghast for it. You can be. I'm asking why are you besmirching or questioning the plan that God brings to pass that you believe God brings to pass. In other words, if if I am aghast at something that happens and I rebuke it and think it shouldn't happen, it makes sense because I don't believe God brought it to pass for his own glorification. You do believe God sovereignly ordained it and brought it to pass for his own glorification, and you are still questioning it and bemoaning it and saying it shouldn't happen. How is that consistent? How is it consistent to say, I believe this is God's ordained will and plan for his greatest glorification, and yet I think it shouldn't have happened? How do, you, how do you hold to those two things consistently, Calvinists? I can say I don't think 9-11 should have happened because I think those people were acting autonomously and separately from the will of God. You believe they were controlled by God and that it shouldn't have happened either. So something God did, something God ordained for his own glorification shouldn't have happened? You don't think, you, again, what's, where's the consistency in that, guys? Tell me without recognizing that God's sovereignty over the evil actions of men, which we see in Scripture, by the way, uh, does not take away the, uh, the, the responsibility. Let's talk about those Scriptures. Let's get together and talk about those Scriptures. I'd love to go through any one of those texts that you think proves compatibilistic determinism, because none of them go so far as to say any of the things that I think compatibilistic determinists are claiming. Uh, of the person committing the sin. One, one more thing. I'll just, I'll just read from Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. Um, again, this is the stuff that if you want to understand our perspective, these are the kind of places that you should be going to. Man. So are you admitting that the quotes from, so given that he didn't read the quotes from actually Calvin or Piper, and he's reading from lower forms of Calvinist, does that prove possibly that maybe I'm just misrepresenting or being accused of misrepresenting the kind of Calvinist you like versus the kind of Calvinist I was confronting? Could that possibly be the situation? Man is a free agent with the power of rational self-determination. He can reflect upon and in an intelligent way choose certain ends and can also determine his action with respect to them. The decree of God, however, carries with it necessity. God has decreed to effectuate all things, or if he has not decreed that, he has at least determined that they must come to pass. He has decided the course of man's life for him. In answer to this objection, it may be said that the Bible certainly does not proceed on the assumption that the divine decree is inconsistent with the free agency of man. It clearly reveals that God has decreed the free acts of man, but also that the actors are nonetheless free and therefore responsible for their acts. Again, I think that's just basic compatibilism still. Um, it, they're free because they're doing according to their desires. But again, you just back it up one step and ask what determines their greatest preset instinct, um, it should be, should be called. There's an illustration 
that Bettner uses in his book that might be helpful. And he says that God is like, God is like an architect, right? Now it's an illustration. It was not perfect. Of course. Of course. He says, God is like an architect and he has designed this cathedral that needs to be built. Now it's a modern cathedral, so it's going to be ornate and beautiful, but it's also going to have HVAC. It's going to have uh, you know fog machines, probably. You probably, know, probably the, not fog. The, well, probably fog. It's, listen, it's, oh, my, it, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my. Oh, I, I thought maybe it was Nick's church, so that's why. No, no, no. But if it was, then yes, then yes, then it fog would machines. Be, so. But for right. our, okay, church, fine, for our say, church, no. This just okay for Nick's. Just say it's Nick's uh, cathedral. All right, Nick Batzig, Presbyterian. All right, so the architect says. Uh, here are the blueprints, and here are the plans, and here are all of the things that has to happen for this building to come into reality. So, is my phone going off? Yeah, here it is. Sorry. All right. God must. And so, out. by laying out this plan, what, what what do we see happening on the construction site? All of these people doing very specific things. Correct. And they are all doing exactly what the architect and the planner has determined. And yet they're doing those things of their own free volition. You know, Bettner, I'm mean, oh, sorry, uh, I think it is Bettner. Yeah. Bettner says it is similar to that. Um, okay. How is that not God being the author? Architect? Is an architect less deterministic than an author? Because Westminster is real careful to say God's not the author of evil. And yet they're ultimately saying God is author architecting evil. Right. I know it's just an analogy, but I'm just saying if if um, the structure of the architect is such that he's the one who's actually not just using what he knows evil men will do in given circumstances, but he's actually determining what evil people are doing in those given circumstances. There is a distinction between those two things, believe it or not. Philosophically, it is well defined. (laughs) Just go read all the journals. And yes, there's still mystery involved within, you know, concepts of omniscience and all that, how that all works together. I'm not denying it. But we're talking about positive claims of the different systematics. I'm not, I'm not critiquing um, just, just anything here. I'm, I'm critiquing actual claims of the actual leaders in this systematic. Some of them disagree with each other, depending on the heights of their Calvinism, but I'm disagreeing with their actual claims. In that we are free to do what we want to do. Uh, we are not coerced by God to do. But are you free to want anything other than what you want, Joe? So when you want to lie to your wife, and give, and you just give an example. I'm not trying to call you a liar or anything like that. But if you lie to your wife yesterday at noon, you wanted to lie to your wife yesterday at noon. Could you have not w- acted upon that desire to lie to her? If you didn't want her to catch you. Um, let's say you stole some of her cake. And you didn't want her to get mad at you because she already told you very specifically not stealing of your cake. And you're tempted to lie and just to, to save face with her. OK, and you're going to blame it on one of the kids and you're tempted to lie. And you lied yesterday at noon. OK, could you have not lied if your if your action is determined by your greatest preset desire, which is not up to you, whether you choose to act upon that desire or not, apparently, because it's your against it's the desires that determine your choices under the Calvinistic worldview as described by Sproul and others. Okay. So your desire determined within those given circumstances and in that moment to choose to lie. Therefore you could not have resisted that temptation, despite what first Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation will overtake you that that which is common to man. In other words, you can, you can resist that temptation. And so that's libertarian freedom. The ability to resist that lie, even though you lied yesterday at noon, you could have done otherwise. That's what libertarian freedom is. Now, maybe you affirm, as some lower Calvinists do, that that uh, that um, Christians do have libertarian freedom in that sense. And if that's the case, I'd love to know it because you, then you got some other questions to a- ask and follow up on with regard to libertarian freedom. But most Calvinists, compatibilistic Calvinists, believe all choices and all actions are ultimately uh, under the divine sovereign will of God in the same meticulous pro- per- per- meticulously providential way. And so the distinction between whether you're a Christian or not a Christian doesn't change that fact um, in the philosophical discussions. The things we don't want to do, so we are responsible for those actions, and yet at the same time, uh, uh, God is sovereign over it all. So He's the architect. Right, and 
what, what I would say is, is that, uh, and what all of these guys say, uh, Burkoff, Spurgeon, Bettner, all of these guys would say the same thing. We cannot see exactly where these two realities meet. Right? We don't mm. try to reconcile them. They're already friends, Spurgeon said. Human responsibility and divine sovereignty. Okay, you still got to prove biblically and define sovereignty as meaning deterministic control over men's desires and actions. Because that's not where I find anywhere. Sovereignty is God sits in heavens and does what he pleases. Psalm 115.3. But you can't assume that he's pleased to meticulously control men's desires and choices. Okay, that's question begging. You got to prove that's what the Bible actually says he wants to do. All right. Verse 16 of the same chapter, as we've pointed out dozens of times, uh, goes on to say that the, though the heavenlies belong to the Father, he has given the earth over to man. Right. So that's a sense of autonomy. He's given choices and rulers and principalities of this dark world to rule. In other words, God has removed his hand. He's allowed for separation. He's allowed for autonomy for people to act freely, separately from him not under the meticulous deterministic control of him. That's why we pray, God, let your will be done in, here on earth as it is in heaven, because we recognize there's a distinction between those two. And not, we don't say, God, we already know uh, all your will is always being done every single time here on earth because everything's done according to your will and your pleasure. We don't pray that way because it's not the way it is. Um, so the, the burden is still on the Calvinists to prove uh, on their compatibilistic worldview, um, they've got to prove that that the sovereignty aspect of it, the, the side of it, actually means God is meticulously controlling men's um, desires and actions. Um, they've got to show that biblically, and I, I, I think they failed to meet that burden. They are true, and we can understand them to greater or lesser degrees, but we don't pit them against one another. The Calvinist affirms both the free agency of man, the responsibility of man, and the sovereignty of God. And so do we. We believe that mankind is responsible. They're actually able to respond. They're able to choose one way or another. They're able to accept or reject the gospel appeal. That is the free agency of men as we define it. The free agency of men as they define it is men doing according to what they desire, and those desires are determined by their nature, which is determined by God within the given circumstances, equally determined by God. And so hard determinism, right? So that's how they defined free moral agency and sovereignty. How they define sovereignty? Determinism. It's all it's hard determinism. So they have defined differently than we do. So we, we are compatibilists too in the sense that we believe God's sovereign. He sits in heaven and does whatever he pleases. He's all powerful. He could do whatever he wants. By the way, he could, if he could do whatever he wants, that means he could create free moral creatures if he wanted to. And so you have to at least grant him the ability to be creative and powerful enough to have created libertarianly free creatures if he wants to. And so if he, if he could do it, then uh, figures that he would do it, especially if that's what, as the theodicy defense says, is what's needed for true love and relationship with her having, is that God granted free will for the very purpose of us having real relationship and real love, um, being true worshipers, not people like rocks being made to cry out, but people who are able to choose whether to cry out in worship or not, um, which is an expression of true love. The traditionalist does not, um, certainly not in the way that we would. And so the straw Calvinist is a misrepresentation of Calvinism. And in this case, most recently, it has been uh, that we've essentially view uh, hu human beings as, as robots and that uh, Calvin uh, didn't, believe that we were, didn't believe that we were responsible, that sinners are responsible for their actions. Did I ever say any of that? Does my article say any of that? No, I'm very careful to quote from Calvin for exactly what he says. Mankind is responsible, i.e. culpable, i.e. justly punishable for things that God is controlling. That's what Calvin says, and that's what I'm having a problem with. That's what I contend with. So, again, you're straw manning my argument, guys. That's why, that's why I sent you the article. Could have read from the article and actually made the case. Yeah, but that's just not the case. We believe absolutely in, in responsibility, and we believe in sovereignty. So, uh, get that off my chest. And um, why, why is he interacting with us anyway? I don't even know why. I don't, even, I don't even know why Soteriology 101 is always talking to us. Like, <laughs> well, I I, we don't talk to us. We don't care. No. This is my first, this is my second podcast responding to you guys. Not always. Don't you love me, Joe? <laughs> oh, well, I think part of it is because uh, we're fun. Like, we are fun. We are, we're, I, don't, I don't feel like he's having fun. I feel like okay, he's all, listen, he's all like puffing up and, I, and everything. You and I, no. You no, and man, I, he's like, he's like mad dogging it. me. He's, he's mad dogging me on here. He is not mad dogging me. He was you. mad dogging me on he there with that one tweet. He was not mad dogging Oh, yeah, he was. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Just, you know, was uh, but I'm just saying that, you know, I think one, we're fun. 
you know, like people like to interact with us. People like to to talk with us. They want to. I don't like talking. Okay, but people, others do like talking to us. And I, don't like I think secondly, there are some people, I'm not saying that, that this is Dr. Really Dr. Do. Flowers, but there are some people that I've noticed that they like to tag us when they're promoting their material. You know what I mean? Like when they're promoting their stuff. Yeah, but uh, we're not promoting his stuff. No, I know that, but you know, people see it on the feeds if they tag in a certain way. You know that, oh, I know oh, that. Okay, so you're saying that Dr. Flowers no, I'm is, saying trying he's to, not. is trying to bump up his numbers because no. he's got a small following no, 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 and we no, no, got no, no. big following. No, you asked the you're, question. No, but that's what no. you said, right? No, no, no. I think you, you said had, that. Well, other people, that might be Dr. the case. Dr. Flowers, I'm not that, saying that. That's, that's not not Jimmy's saying. argument. No, I'm not I'm saying that. I'm not saying that. You asked the question, why do people talk to us And you said Dr. Flowers is trying to like bump up his numbers. There are other people that are. I can tell that. I can tell that. All right. So I got that off my chest as best as I can. You know, it's not the kind of thing I like uh, really getting into in this format. Plus, it's just cordial. I think that's the third reason why people want to actually engage in good conversation. No, nah, but like him, like, yeah. like this is how a dummy responds. Like that, that's not cool. He man. did not Come say on. dummy. Well, that's what it. Meant. No, it did not. He doesn't have a good answer. That's what he said. This guy doesn't okay, have a good stop answer. Stop it. That's what it says. I know that, but it didn't say dummy. Okay, but it meant dummy. It did not. All right, you go on. Get it. What, what do you want to talk about? Okay, you you picked a straw man too. Now you you talk about your straw man. Okay. <laughs> And they go on talking about other straw men that are used against Calvinists with good good banter. Um, and uh, Jimmy is right. I didn't call him a dummy. I said that he didn't answer the question. And he still hasn't answered the question, by the way. Have you noticed? Never explained why it's okay for them to question, to talk back to what God has sovereignly ordained to bring to pass. All he said is it's okay for God to judge the people who he sovereignly ordains to act in that way. He never told us why it's okay for him to question God's sovereign ordinations for his own self-glorification. So I'll leave you with that. Blessings to y'all. By the way, if you'd like to become a supporter of Sociology 101, become one of our patrons, one-time giver or a, um, a monthly donor. We'd love your support. You can go to Sociology 101 and click on the uh, support link. Love to have you join our team. Um, or if you'd like to take a course with us at Trinity Sim, you can click on the classroom link there at Sociology 101 in the, the menu bar, and I'll tell you more information about how you can uh, become a part of uh, the Trinity family. It's a great school if you're looking for a higher education. So I appreciate all you guys do. Talk to you next time. Blessings. Bye-bye.